April 20th, 2016 marks 10 years since the Japanese release of Mother 3, and to this day, it remains my favorite video game of all time. It's not just that it's a superlative follow-up to Earthbound, aka Mother 2. Earthbound is a great game that's well deserving of its cult following, but to me, it doesn't have a patch on Mother 3. No, what makes Mother 3 so remarkable is that it subverts the trappings of its medium to present a microcosm of the human experience. Its plot speaks to universal themes of loss, loss of family, loss of place, loss of innocence, disconnection from the natural world, from each other, from ourselves, and dissatisfaction with the pursuits of modern living. So while it may ultimately tell what can be boiled down to a traditional tale of good versus evil, there are and will continue to be as many valid interpretations of what Mother 3 is really about as there are people who've played it. Now, I've been playing it annually since 2009, and I'm still finding something new, whether it's a stray line of dialogue that provides deeper insight into its cast of characters, or a fresh way to connect its various allegories to real-world events. To celebrate Mother 3's 10th birthday, a birthday that is almost certainly going to be its last one without an official English localization, here are 10 things I love about Mother 3. When I first played Mother 3, my grief over my own mother's death was still nearly as sharp as it had been when I'd lost her six years before. While the game's opening chapter, Night of the Funeral, is heartbreaking in its portrayal of the death of the beloved Hinoa, mother of Lucas and Klaus, daughter of Alec, and wife of Flint, it's in chapter 6 that the game's depiction of grief hit me in a very real way. As Lucas wanders aimlessly in a field of sunflowers, he comes face to face with an apparition of his mother, looking exactly as she did when he last saw her, though he's grown three years older. Witnessing their reunion for the first time was like exhaling after holding my breath for years, and as I watched as the two figures remained just out of reach of each other, I thought about all the things that had happened since my mom died, all the things I'd never get to share with her, and it made me feel her presence in a way I hadn't since she was alive. Putting this essay together some seven years after I first played Mother 3, on what would have been my mom's 64th birthday in fact, I'm struck by the enduring beauty of the moment, especially because the whole thing lasts no longer than a minute. Indeed, video games have never shied away from portraying death, but Mother 3 remains the gold standard when it comes to varied, realistic portrayals of the way death affects those who carry the weight of that loss. The initial stage of Flint's grief is direct, aggressive, even a little frightening as he lashes out violently at the friends who've just mounted a search party to help him find his missing children and wife. For years after, he is seen to wander in the mountains surrounding his village, ostensibly in search of the missing Klaus, but really trying to find meaning in an existence that has been turned upside down. Klaus's grief, which initially manifests in him disappearing into the mountains in vengeful pursuit of Hinoa's killer, eventually results in his being made a pawn of the very machinations that led to his mother's violent death. On the other hand, Lucas's grief is mostly internalized. He's a character who's been told from a young age that it's not okay for boys to cry, so as he grows older he tends to keep his feelings to himself. But he eventually becomes the rock that his remaining family members lean on when they're unable to cope with their own grief. There are many ways to deal with the loss of a loved one, and as someone who's experienced a fair share of death, all of the game's portrayals ring true to me. Final Fantasy VII might have been the first video game to cause game journalists to pose the question, can a video game make you cry? But Mother 3 is the first, and still the best, when it comes to demonstrating that grief goes far beyond tears. Good grief, I need a break from all that discussion of grief, and you probably do too. Here's something a little livelier to lift your spirits. It's called Bon Voyage, Amigo. It's featured in Chapter 4 of Mother 3, and it's one of the finest examples of how composer Shogo Sakai's music is used not just to underscore, but to enhance the emotional weight of Mother 3's story. Enjoy.
Perhaps the most complex issue examined in Mother 3 is the way Western European industrialization decentralizes and eventually destroys tribal communities. In the beginning of the game, the village of Tazmili is presented as something of a utopian ideal, where goods are given freely and neighbors help each other when called upon, without any expectation of compensation. By the time the villagers are introduced to the concept of money, it takes only a few short years for Tazmili to become a caricature of its former self, a destination for wealthy travelers looking to spend a weekend getting back in touch with nature. Meanwhile, the Tasmiliers have become isolated from one another, with those who bought into the promise of progress now glued to their TV and computer screens, and those who refuse to be swept up in the future left to wallow in their own backwater in the outskirts of town. It's no surprise that by the end of the game, the people of Tasmili, having become dissatisfied with the so-called pursuit of happiness, flee their hometown en masse, misguided by the glamorous but superficial promises of a better life in New Pork City. But wait, there's more, because while it's fun to read Mother 3 as a Marxist indictment on progress, the game subverts that analysis with a late in-game exposition dump by a character who up until that point had spent his entire life in a state of voluntary silence. As environmental writer Isaac Yuen puts it in his excellent essay Mother 3, a literary video game, the player learns that the utopian world of Tasmili is and always was a lie, an artificial construction by survivors of a destroyed world who chose to wipe their memories and begin anew. Because they denied their history, neglected to cultivate deep mythologies, and ignored the darker aspects of human nature, Tasmili became an exceedingly fragile society. Its innocence offered no strength against outside influences. In the end, the utopian vision of Tasmili is just as unsustainable as the shallow grandeur of New Pork City. Both exist only as shiny facades that crumbled upon closer inspection. It was George Santayana who first said that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, but what about those of us who like leader, are so intent on keeping up the pretenses of our daily lives that we sweep the past under the rug until it's too late. The true tragedy of Tasmili, and what I find so fascinating about it, is not that it's so easily destroyed by capitalism, but that the longing it makes us feel for simpler times is based entirely on a lie. A lie that we are actively involved in perpetrating. One of Mother 3's greatest strengths is its multifaceted depictions of many different types of people, and nowhere is this more evident than in its treatment of transgender people. Magypsies, as they're called in Mother 3, are described by Alec, Hinoa's father, as mysterious, neither man nor woman, strange, and good-natured, and they're certainly shown to be all of these things. Initially, they seem to be played for humor. Their depictions as bearded, effeminate, middle-aged men wearing makeup and women's clothes seems to feed directly into transgender stereotypes. But this is in keeping with the rest of the game, which injects humor into even the most serious moments. Viewed holistically, the Magypsies' visual depictions belie the reverence with which they're treated by the narrative. As the guardians of the Nowhere Islands on which Mother 3 takes place, they are wise, respected, and play a critical role in Lucas' awakening to his true potential. Perhaps just as important is the way other characters in the game view them. Female characters refer to them with female pronouns. Men resolutely insist on calling them men except for one shopkeeper who calls a magypsy named Ionia a pretty lady. Some treat them as somehow less than human. A group of villagers observes passively as Ionia struggles in the aftermath of an assault upon her, while others make it quite clear that they think everyone should be able to live in whatever way makes them happy, and still others don't care one way or another. This broad depiction of reactions to the magypsy speaks to the ongoing real-life struggles faced by trans people today, and while that's a bigger discussion than I can speak to here, the fact that it's even a consideration in a video game published by one of the industry's biggest and most influential companies has me hopeful that we'll eventually learn, as a species, to accept and respect peoples of all walks of life. Speaking of subjects that might be considered too taboo for Nintendo, did you know there's an extended sequence in Mother 3 where Lucas and friends have a bad mushroom trip and are forced to confront their greatest fears and deepest insecurities? I've long maintained that the Magypsies are the biggest reason why the ultra-conservative Nintendo of America passed on localizing the game during the Game Boy Advance days, but today's NOA is a different company, one that seems more willing to embrace so-called alternative lifestyles in its games. Still, 
There's a huge difference between being inclusive of people who don't conform to heteronormative standards and depicting children consuming psychotropic drugs. Now, I'm not going to call foul if this section is heavily altered in an official English localization. We'll always have a fan translation after all. But I truly believe this part of the story is critical to Lucas's development, and I'm deeply curious to see how they're going to pull it off. Like most RPGs, Mother 3 sets players up for a final confrontation between hero and villain, and the showdown between Lucas and Porky is about as epic as you could possibly imagine. But it doesn't end there. Instead of letting players sit back and bask in the glory of a job well done, there's one more confrontation that needs to be wrapped up. The showdown between Lucas and the Masked Man. Of course, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the Masked Man was Klaus all along. Who else could it have been? But the lack of suspense over his true identity doesn't make the clash between brothers any less gut-wrenching. Klaus, blinded by grief and rage, attacks Lucas relentlessly, and as Lucas reverts to the guarded child he once was, both Flint and the spirit of Hinoa plead with Klaus to remember who he is and end his pointless crusade. Lucas is eventually able to bring himself to fight back, but he does so half-heartedly, often purposely missing his brother, leaving Klaus to deal one final attack that he knows will be fatal to himself. As Klaus finally reawakens to his true identity, Lucas catches the familiar scent of his brother, and then Klaus succumbs to his wounds, bringing the events of Mother 3 full circle. The game ends with Klaus's death and the destruction of the Noah Islands. Lucas, his friends, and even the player have failed. But as everything fades away, a single word question punctuates the darkness. End? As it turns out, there's a little bit more to do, but not for Lucas. It's here that players get to take direct control of themselves, walking around in the darkness, encountering the villagers of Tasmali, each insisting that everything will be okay in their world, and praying for a similar outcome for the world of the player. It's a fourth wall breaking, never ending story kind of moment that for me becomes more powerful with each new playthrough, because I know that no matter how many times I try to save them, the people of Tasmali are doomed to their fate, just as humanity has been since the beginning of our time on Earth. Making the player an active participant in the events, and then going a step further to connect them to the real world in which the player lives, it's one of those things this series does so well, and it's why I absolutely love Mother 3. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about Mother 3 is that it even happened in the first place. It's no secret the game had an impossibly difficult gestation period. Initially planned during the development of Earthbound as a follow-up for the Super Nintendo, the game was first reborn as a fully polygonal adventure for the Nintendo 64 disk drive before eventually being downgraded to a standard N64 game, which debuted in playable form at Nintendo's annual Space World Expo in August of 1999, and was then officially cancelled almost exactly one year later. In a frank discussion among series creator Shigesato Itoi and producer Satoru Iwata and Shigeru Miyamoto that was posted alongside the cancellation announcement, Itoi offered a heartfelt apology to the fans who'd waited so long for the game, and there's such a sense of personal failure from the three men that reading the entire interview can be almost heartbreaking. That the game was retooled so many times before ultimately being released as a Game Boy Advance game well into the era of the Nintendo DS makes its very existence seem like something of a marvel and the fact that it's one of the greatest games Nintendo ever created makes it a bona fide miracle. For those players holding out for an official English localization, I truly believe this is the year you get to discover what the rest of us already know. It was well worth the wait. Happy birthday, Mother 3.